Um, this is the uh, fifth quilt that I have put together for programming for from my mother's collection. She made 13 quilts, two of which are in private collection, but I have 11 of the quilts in my home. So um, you've probably seen some other quilts, uh, Women of the Plains last year, I did a lot of that one. Uh, the One Room Schoolhouse, the Purple Sandwich Quilt. Um, I have one called the 23rd Psalm. Learn how to become a sheep rancher, I'm here to help you. Um, so um, I have uh, my Valentine's Day present yesterday was that the uh, booklet of this mm. quilt was done. And it, um, Rod down at uh, By All Means Graphics has done the publishing of my booklets. So I have them for sale over there if you're interested. <clears throat> Today this is called Women of War. My mother remembers after World War II, I was born in 1949, I am a genuine baby boomer. The rest of the baby boomers in the house? <laughs> All right, okay. My parents only had, okay, I'm on film. My, <laughs> my parents had three children, and then they had uh, adopted four more. But in the very beginning, after World War II, um, my mother noticed a lot of foreign brides coming into town. We had a um, Air Force Base north of Cut Bank, Cut Bank, Montana, up by Glacier National Park, 25 miles from the Canadian border. And there was, between Cut Bank and the Canadian border was an Air Force Base. But there wasn't any place for the families to stay. So they came to town, and many of them lived on our block. We lived on Fifth Avenue. And, many, and my mother made a point, she made a point to get to know them. We'd come home from school, and she'd be teaching the Korean lady across the street how to put on a diaper. Uh, she would have the uh, German lady over, uh, who was teaching my mother how to make sausage. And the, um, so many women lived in our town. My mother was really drawn to the question, my mother always started her life with a question, why did so many women, foreign brides, marry American men after fighting in their country and come to the United States? Why did they do that? So she just um, uh, created that question and then uh, began her research. So as a result of that, um, over the years, she began collecting stories of women she met, she interviewed, who asked to be interviewed, and she um, heard their entire story, and then from the story she would collect a scene. And she would design the scene, she would create the scene, and then she put it on uh, here, on her quilt. So. Um, how many of you have a member of your family or has served in, in a war or you have served in a war? There you go, you are my people, okay. Um, so this one, this will depict, uh, there's a, one or two little stories about World War I and then the rest are about World War II, both in <coughs> Europe and in the Philippines. And you might remember um, uh, a few of these stories. So 2020 is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Okay. So you're gonna hear a lot on NPR, uh, Channel 2, uh, history museums, uh, documentaries, movie films. There's gonna be a lot this year. You're gonna be bombarded a lot with uh, programs about the war, World War I, World War II, so um, one of the things that my mother does, uh, um, her quilts mostly center around, is women and women's history. So this quilt is her story. Not his story, not his story, her story. So I'm gonna just begin, and I'm going to read excerpts and little snippets of some of the stories. We're not gonna tell all of the stories today. So uh, we're going to start with a scene that's not on the quilt, but it sets the pace, it sets the um, time, and begins to tell you about how, it, how people began to disappear in Europe, World War II. And this is by Katie Pikars. She was a Polish national from Great Falls, Montana. 
Um, Katie remembers, she said, we had rules. We always had to be home by six o'clock for supper. If we didn't come home by then, our parents knew something terrible had happened. I was 13 years old when the Germans invaded Poland and on March 13, 1941, I was 14, I was taken to Germany to work as a slave in a labor camp on a farm. When we went to school that morning, the last thing Daddy said was, don't walk in bunches. You must walk separately. You see, it was easy, she said, to gather up a bunch of kids when you're, it's not easy to gather up a bunch of kids when you're all together, but of course, after school, five of us were walking home together. How quickly children forget, she said. A truck driver saw us and yelled, stop. Two kids ran into the field. They were shot, one in the arm, one in the leg. <laughs> the other three of us were gathered up and put on a truck. We were taken to a depot, put on a train, in an animal car. The car was so full, we stood up like match sticks. The next day, 16 hours later, we each got a piece of dark bread and a piece of horse meat sausage. The train then stopped in Auschwitz. We were all herded into an airplane hangar and given one army blanket, but no food. We slept on the straw on the floor of the hangar, women, children, men, all together. And we found out that the straw was meant for the mattresses of the German elite. That sets the scene, how quickly people just disappeared off the street. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna go to scene number one, and it's called The Efficiency of Death. And Greg, bless your heart. Greg, would you toggle to the very first scene? And I'm going to point it out right here. This one up here. As you can see, there are some women. They're naked. They're putting on um, a girdle of some kind and it's called The Efficiency of Death. So Katie, who started the story, continues. She said, when we arrived in Auschwitz, we were told to go to another building and take a shower. We first had to take off all our clothes and put them into a bundle. We walked up two flights of stairs, naked. Two SS men were waiting there. We had to get up on a little stool, bend over, pull our legs apart to see if we had any diseases. People that were dirty went with the disease group and we never saw them again. We stayed in Auschwitz for four days. We were then taken to the shower, instructed to put on a wide leather belt with a big handle around our waist. The shower would fumigate or delouse us. I couldn't understand why. There were three shower rooms, each 30 by 40 feet, each as big as a house. There were over 200 people per shower room. They packed one room, shut, and locked the door. They packed another shower room, locked and shut, the, shut and locked the door. The last group, my group, only had 19 people. All of a sudden, we could hear screaming from the other shower rooms. The shower heads looked like fire extinguishers. As instructed, we turned the switch to on to let the shower come out but nothing happened. Suddenly, the SS men unlocked the door and told us to get out. No shower today. We asked what happened to the other people. They said they'd gone. Later, we learned that the leather belts with handles made it easier to carry the dead out of the gas chamber. Gassing only 19 people is not an efficient use of gas. Wow. So, this would be the shower room and all the people in here and the shower heads coming down there. Everybody, children, men, women, grandmas, grandpas, everybody in here. So our next story is called 24 Hours a Day. Now this was Helen Fireman. She lived in Denver, Colorado. And Helen asked my mother to come to her house and uh, meet with her. Her children did not want to hear her story from Auschwitz. Mother, that's in the past, we don't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear that their mother had suffered. 
So Helen met my mother at the door. She extended her hand and her tattoo was on her forearm. And Helen's just said, there were eight crematoriums in Auschwitz. They were run by slave labor. My husband's brother was forced to work on one and burned up all of his own relatives. The crematories could not keep up with the burning. They were fired 24 hours a day. The slave laborers had to also dig the mass graves. There was one time when the prisoners tried to revolt. Some of the men had acquired some dynamite and a plan was to blow up the ovens. But something went horribly wrong and only two sticks of dynamite went off. Many of our people were killed after that. We saw the worst of the worst in human beings. There was cannibalism in the men's camp, though none that I know of in the women's camp. The next story, we're going to go down a little bit, Paul. Mm -hmm. It's called Life's Lessons, right down here at the very bottom. Greg, can you toggle over? There's an airplane at the top. Can you see that one? Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. This is called Life's Lessons. And it's by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Goff, and she's a Polish Christian. And Elizabeth shared this story with my mom. So in this scene, you'll see an airplane going overhead. You will see a woman and a little girl in the middle, and then another little girl standing off to the side. The little girl in the red coat standing off to the side is Elizabeth. And she said, I will always remember the day the nun at school whipped me so terribly because I couldn't remember my lesson. I had studied hard and I was prepared to recite. Then, on the way to school, I was holding my mother's hand as a plane flew overhead. The streets had just been covered in fresh black tar. A nurse and her little girl were crossing the road hand in hand in the tar. An airplane flew out of the sky and started dropping incinerary, bomb, incinerary bombs. The whole tarred street exploded in flames. The two in the street couldn't get out of their shoes because the street was on fire. I stood there <clears throat> with my mother, frozen, and watched as the little girl and her nurse were burned alive in the boiling tar. I couldn't help them, so I was whipped. She says, if you ask me who suffers the most during a war, then I'll tell you. It's the women and the children, the ones who are helpless, the ones caught in the big spider web of war. No one is immune. There is no way for them out except to die. Children, of course, are the most vulnerable. They don't understand what's happening, and the adults cannot explain it. And here we see a boat at the wrong angle going down, and we see bodies in the water right here. The tragedy of war. Maureen Nielsen, she was British, shared this with my mom. The situation was so serious that the government decided that the least they could do was to save as many children as possible. Very hastily, arrangements were made to ship children to other British possessions and to the United States. The first ship to go out was called the City of Phoenix but it was immediately torpedoed right off um, as it took off and it limped back to shore. So they got another ship called the City of Burners. It was not allowed to set sail until it could go in a huge convoy. When the convoy was assembled, it contained over 100 ships. Once underway, the, no ship could break radio silence for any reason. If it did, it could put the rest of the convoy in danger. Um, there were many adults to shepherd the children. The convoy was out in the mid-Atlantic when it was time for the ships in the convoy to separate and go their separate directions. It was considered safe from German submarines. The city of Berners would set off by itself on its way to Canada and its cargo of precious children. The other warships weren't out of complete sight when a torpedo struck the bow. It was dark. 
all of the children had just been put to bed. They had to be roused and life jackets put on. The sea had started to boil with one of its famous North Atlantic storms. The first lifeboat, lifeboat was lowered. Angry waves could not let the little boat move away from the big ship. Between the waves and the suction of the big ship, they were paralyzed against the side. It was a long time before all of the children were launched. There weren't enough lifeboats, lifeboats to go around. The captain and most of the crew went down. One of the women who did survive said the waves were so high they would wash over us. I could hold on to one child and I could hold on to the boat. I, could, I had to watch many children float away and I couldn't do anything about it. By morning, <clears throat> a Norwegian freighter saw us and some were rescued. About half of the children were lost at sea. We were brought back to England and that was the end of Operation Rescue. Now I'm gonna switch sides right now. <clears throat> While we were battling war over there, the Japanese came over and started battling with us on the other side. We were surrounded by war on both sides. I have to put in a little caveat here. The Japanese didn't want the Hawaiian Islands. What they wanted was a diversion. And they wanted us, they wanted to cripple our fleet so that we would not go and uh, mess up their plans to take over the West, uh, the, the, uh, West Indies because there was a huge oil field out over in the West Indies and the Japanese wanted the oil field. That's why they bombed Pearl Harbor to destroy the fleet so we wouldn't go over there and help them. So there was a woman that my mother got to meet. She got to meet two women in California who were the last survivors of internment in the Philippines during that, uh, the Japanese invasion. Uh, her name is Helen Colgen. She was Dutch, and she was uh, uh, one of the last surviving uh, in uh, on last survivors of internment camps in the Philippines. So, uh, Greg, if you would bring us to this scene right here, all the women. So you can see the tropical leaves right here. All the women are sitting around, and there is someone facing the women right here. She's got a stand right here with a, a little pieces of paper on it. So this is called Song of Survival. Some of you may know this. Helen wrote a book called Song of Survival of their experience uh, in the internment camps of the Japanese in the Dutch West Indies. Um, from that book, a movie was made called Paradise Road, starring Glenn Close. It's still on Netflix, you can still pick it up. Um, so uh, they, we're gonna pick up, Helen is gonna pick up after they've been in the internment camp for a while. Two women must be given credit for saving our sanity. Margaret Dreiber, a Presbyterian missionary, and Nora Chambers, a graduate of London's Royal Academy of Music. Margaret wrote down the entire works of the composers such as Beethoven, Dubasi, Chopin from memory. Nora engaged, uh, arranged the orchestral and piano pieces for four-part harmony. They made us into an orchestra choir. Paper and pencil were scarce. We no longer had the strength to learn both the words and the music. We had many different languages among us, nor did we have the physical strength to stand when we sang. Each choir member was conjured up, had to conjure up something to sit while singing. We would try to have a concert once a month. It served two purposes. One, each singer had to stay alive for the next concert, and two, the ladies in the audience had to stay alive to encourage the choir members. How well I remember the first concert. 30 singers filed into the space and sat down on their little stools. Nora Chambers lifted her hands for the first measures of Largo. 
At the first notes floating through the air, a guard came running out from the guardhouse with his bayonet fixed and shouting, hook, hook. But Nora continued to conduct. The guard became so entranced by the music that he stopped ranting and quietly listened to the entire concert. Soon, the captain at the camp and all the guards looked forward to a regularly monthly concert and would sit up front to enjoy them. This concert of voices lifted into the air and carried across the camp and into the, men, <coughs> into the men's camp. The men would gather at the wire to hear the voices carry over from the women. It gave them hope. The music carried over the wire to the men's camp, and the men stepped close. Oh, and it gave them hope. Do you need some water? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, water. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm fine. <clears throat> so let's move on to liberation. How many people want to be liberated? <laughs> OK, we're going to move on to liberation. Maureen Nielsen was from Ireland. She said, I was 14 years old and living in Great Britain when the Germans tried to evade, invade there. The things I remember still uh, concerned home life for a child my age. I remember one time I had invited an American officer to come to my home and have dinner with us. My mother's big question was, what do American officers eat. Several women in the neighborhood were consulted and it was decided by someone that they ate corn on the cob. <laughs> well, she had never prepared that before. Uh, it, in Europe, corn on the cob was animal food. Cookbooks were consulted. They didn't help. She found a greengrocer who had a few ears. She brought them home and the advice of the grocer was to boil them. So she did. She started early in the morning <laughs> and cooked them all day long. <laughs> no one had told her to take the green husks off, so the whole mess simmered all day. <laughs> Occasionally, a neighbor would stop by to see how she was doing, and they would try to spear an ear of corn. Mother's comment was, if the American officers were as tough as the corn they eat, we'll surely win the war. <laughs> so we're going to now go to the very center of the quilt, Greg, if you'd be so kind to the Statue of Liberty right here. I don't have to explain that. You all recognize her. This scene is called The Golden Door. Maureen Nielsen, our Irish lady, continued on. She says, no one that lives in this country can imagine what the Statue of Liberty means to an immigrant. The people will line the rails of the ship and no one speaks. They each have their own reaction. Most of them just cry. Now I have to pause here and tell you I had to do some research. I've never been to the Statue of Liberty. Who's been to the Statue of Liberty? And who has read the poem at her feet? Very good. So the plaque at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty comes from Emma Lazarus. Uh, she, she's 1849 to 1887, okay? One of America's first important Jewish poets. The sonnet is called The New Colossus, and it, she originally wrote it for a fundraiser in the 1800s. It didn't go over well. The poems weren't very well accepted. But after her death, a friend of hers began a campaign to memorialize her, her sonnet. The poem helped shape the popular idea of the Statue of Liberty as a welcoming mother of Amer uh, and of America, the great nation of immigrants. The Statue of Liberty arrived from France in 1886. The poem was inscribed in 1903. 
and I read. Emma was 34 years old when she wrote this poem, The New Colossus. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon uh, hand blows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep ancient, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So the last short, tiny little story I'm going to tell you has no scene. Once again, we started without a scene, and we're going to end without a scene. <clears throat> and Irene Nielsen from Denmark continued a little bit of her story. And she said, um, my mother was head of the resistance in our little village in Denmark. She taught the sabotage at our dining room table. That is, how to make hand grenades and small bombs, arts and crafts. <laughs> the village had a small rickety jail. It was seldom used until the Germans' occupation. The Germans stood, um, soon had the building full to overflowing with our young men from the villages. It wasn't too bad, though. The boys sawed the bars on the windows, and every night after bed check, they would slip out and do the sabotage, and then they'd jump back into jail and rest all day. The war was over in Denmark, May uh, 1945, and on that day, I remember hearing someone say, well, what will we do for excitement now? <laughs> That's the end of the story quilt. <laughs> okay.